was tremendous singing. It's sort of a disappointment to have to listen to me after that. I feel like just <laughs> continuing on with what we were just doing. When I wrote my book, The Forgotten Trinity, a number of years ago, actually, I think that was 20 years ago, um, I began the book by making the statement, I love the Trinity. And I asked my reader, when was the last time you heard anyone say that? And for, unfortunately, the majority of people, they would have to answer, mm, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say that at all. In the church, you will hear people talking about, I love the Bible, I love Jesus, I love the gospel, I love worship, but very, very rarely will you hear anyone say, I love the Trinity. And this creates a contradiction because on the one hand, formally, we will say we will withhold fellowship from anyone who denies this central doctrine, and yet the world looks at us and goes, you know, I... I never hear him talking about that doctrine. And if we're honest with ourselves, how often is it that we, in our worship, in our prayer, even in the worship service, in the ministry of music, contemplate the nature of our triune God? We just did in that song. It was beautifully done. I, I noticed this past holiday season we sang some incarnational hymns, and they tend to be extremely Trinitarian, deeply Trinitarian in their expression. Those were neat, but let's be honest. Most of the time, when we consider our lives, we consider our daily lives, how does the doctrine of the Trinity impact us? And if that's the case, then are we really consistent to say, this is the dividing line, this is absolutely one of those things that cannot possibly be compromised, anything that does not have a clear affirmation of this truth is not Christian. If we would be uncomfortable for someone to walk up to us with a video camera and a microphone and ask us, what is the doctrine of the Trinity? Then is it really the defining element of our theology? That's a question each one of us has to ask. When you think of the condescension that God has shown in giving to us his word, in those special places, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, where for a moment the very veil of eternity is drawn aside and we can catch a glimpse of the pre-incarnate Christ and the relationship with the Father and, and we're allowed to look into, into things that angels would desire to see into and they've been given to us in the Word. Or in John chapter 1, when it says, In the beginning is the Word, and the Word was with God. Pros ton theon. There was, there was intimate communion between the Father and the Son in eternity past. God did not have to reveal these things to us. He did not have to be so clear in the revelation he's given to us of himself, but he wants us to know him so that we can truly worship in spirit and in truth. Pagan worship is where you worship the unknown God. That's not Christian worship. We do not worship a God we do not know. We worship the God who has made himself known, and in fact, that's one of the beauties of who Jesus Christ is because since he is the exact representation of his very nature, then because we have seen Jesus, there's no confusion between he and the Father, but we can know the Father's character perfectly because the Son so perfectly represents him, and we can therefore have a true knowledge of God. Have you ever thought the privilege that is yours to have that kind of information, to have that kind of revelation that has been given to you? On those days when you're wondering why God is so mean to you, why his providence is so negative towards you, think about things like that. Think about the privileges that you've been given. 
those kind of privileges transcend any type of temporary situation. Well, you know, your, your car is wrapped around a tree, but you're alive, and, and uh, so that's just terrible. Well, that's a temporary thing. Many of our suffering brothers and sisters in other lands, sitting in a prison cell, gain so much joy and happiness and contentment because they contemplate the true things of God. And they know where real joy comes from. I normally do not do this, but I want to read to you a fairly lengthy section of text. Oh, that's, you're not supposed to do that. But when it is from what I consider to be simply a, a modern masterpiece on the subject of the Trinity, I want to make sure in all of the information that's been thrown at you, that these fundamental thoughts are expressed to you clearly, and I can't express them any more clearly than this writer did. I mentioned him briefly before when I spoke on Islam. But I know that when I was truly attempting to get a grasp on the doctrine of the Trinity, I was trying to come to understand it in my biblical studies as a young man, I found Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield to be a tremendous guiding light. And a few years ago, I got to visit his grave in the Princeton Seminary, which is right next to the Princeton Cemetery. I'll let you figure that one out for a second. The one is still living, and the other sadly has died. The term Trinity is not a biblical term. And we are not using biblical language when we define what is expressed by it as the doctrine that there is only one true God, but in the unity of the Godhood, Godhead, there are three co-eternal and co-equal persons, the same in substance, but distinct in subsistence. A doctrine so defined can be spoken of as a biblical doctrine only on the principle, listen here, that the sense of Scripture is Scripture. And the definition of a biblical doctrine in such unbiblical language can be justified only on the principle that it is better to preserve the truth of Scripture than the words of Scripture. The doctrine of the Trinity lies in Scripture in solution when it is crystallized from its solvent. It does not cease to be scriptural, but only comes into clearer view. Or to speak without figure, the doctrine of the Trinity is given to us in Scripture not in formulated definition, but in fragmentary allusions. When we assembled the disjecta membra, the different members into their organic unity, we are not passing from Scripture, but entering more thoroughly into the meaning of Scripture. We may state the doctrine in technical terms supplied by philosophical reflection, but the doctrine stated is a genuinely scriptural doctrine. He went on in speaking of the New Testament writers to say, they do not then place two new gods by the side of Jehovah as alike with him to be served and worshipped. They conceive Jehovah as himself at once Father, Son, and Spirit. In presenting this one Jehovah as Father, Son, and Spirit, they do not even betray any lurking feeling that they are making innovations. Without apparent misgiving, they take over Old Testament passages and apply them to Father, Son, and Spirit indifferently. Obviously, they understand themselves and wish to be understood as setting forth in the Father, Son, and Spirit just the one God that the God of the Old Testament revelation is. And they are as far as possible from recognizing any breach between themselves and the Fathers in presenting their enlarged conception of the divine being. The God of the Old Testament was their God. And their God was a trinity, and their sense of the identity of the two was so complete that no question as to it was raised in their minds. It is clear, in other words, that as we read the New Testament, we are not witnessing the birth of a new conception of God. What we meet in its pages is a firmly established conception of God underlying and giving its tone to the whole fabric. It is not in a text here and there the New Testament bears its testimony, the doctrine of the Trinity. The whole book is Trinitarian to the core. All its teaching is built on the assumption of the Trinity, and its allusions to the Trinity are frequent, cursory, easy, confident. It is with a view to the cursoriness of the allusions to it 
in the New Testament that has been remarked that the doctrine of the Trinity is not so much heard as overheard in the statements of Scripture. It would be more exact to say that it is not so much inculcated as presupposed. The doctrine of the Trinity does not appear in the New Testament in the making, but as already made. In other words, if I might comment, the New Testament writers are looking back upon the revelation. They're not trying to make the revelation itself. They are writing in light of its reality. We cannot speak of the doctrine of the Trinity, therefore, if we study exactness of speech as revealed in the New Testament any more than we can speak of it as revealed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written before its revelation, the New Testament after it. The revelation itself was made not in word, but in deed. It was made in the incarnation of God the Son and the outpouring of God the Holy Spirit. The relation of the two testaments to this revelation is in the one case that of preparation for it, and the other, that of product of it. The revelation itself is embodied just in Christ and the Holy Spirit. This is as much to say that the revelation of the Trinity was incidental to and the inevitable effect of the accomplishment of redemption. And I add in, hence the connection between the Trinity and the gospel itself. It was in the coming of the Son of God in the likeness of sinful flesh to offer himself a sacrifice for sin and the coming of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment that the trinity of persons in the unity of the Godhead was once for all revealed to men. We may understand also, however, from the same central fact, why it is that the doctrine of the trinity lies in the New Testament rather in the form of illusions than in express teaching or what we might call creedal statements why it is rather everywhere presupposed, coming only here and there into incidental expression rather than formally inculcated. It is because the revelation, having been made in the actual occurrences of redemption, was already the common property of all Christian hearts. In speaking and writing to one another, Christians, therefore, rather spoke out of their common Trinitarian consciousness and remind one another of their common fund of belief then instructed one another in what was already the common property of all. This is very important for, because you will be challenged. Why isn't there a verse that just says this or says it this way? Well, look at the emails you've exchanged. Let's say you've come here with somebody else. Look at the emails that you have exchanged with those who've come with you. There were all sorts of things in those emails that you presupposed because there was a common body of knowledge. We're going to G3, and so you don't have to, in every email, say, we are going to the G3 conference, it is outside of Atlanta, and it's going to be cold. And, uh, you know, you, you didn't have to lay all that out in every single email. In the same way as the New Testament writers are speaking, they don't have to restate what is the common faith and experience that the entire church had. This is extremely, extremely important. We are to look for... And we shall find in the New Testament allusions to the Trinity rather than evidence of how the Trinity, believed in by all, was conceived by the authoritative teachers of the church, then formal attempts on their part by authoritative declarations to bring the church into the understanding that God is a Trinity. That's what people want us to find. But if we're right about how the Trinity was revealed and what the nature of it is, that is not, is not what we would expect to find. People, for example, say that Paul made up Christianity. If that were the case, then what we would find in Paul's epistles is an attempt to argue for this new belief rather than what we find, and that is he is very comfortable in writing to people and say, this is what Christians have always believed. It's just the, the illusions. It's his, his ability to talk about the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of God in, within the same sentence and not even be embarrassed that he was using that kind of terminology. It's exactly what we'd expect. The fundamental proof that God is a trinity is supplied thus by the fundamental revelation of the Trinity in fact. That is to say, in the incarnation of God the Son and the outpouring of God the Holy Spirit. In a word, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are the fundamental proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. This is as much to say that all the evidence of whatever kind and from whatever source derived that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh, and that the Holy Spirit is a divine person, is just so much evidence for the doctrine of the Trinity. And that when we go to the New Testament for evidence of the Trinity, we are to seek it not merely in the scattered allusions to the Trinity as such, numerous and instructive as they are, but primarily in the whole mass of evidence which the New Testament provides of the deity of Christ and the divine personality of the Holy Spirit. 
when we have said this, we have said in effect that the whole mass of the New Testament is evidence for the Trinity. May I recommend to you a book that B.B. Warfield wrote on the deity of Christ uh, titled Lord of Glory. Because the book will help you to understand that very often we as Christians overlook some of the best evidence the New Testament provides to us because we allow those who attack our faith to define the parameters of the argument rather than looking at the entirety of what the New Testament reveals to us. Now with that foundation in mind, I have some more reading to do, but this time from the Word of God. And if you wish to turn with me, you may. If you want to just listen, I want to read to you the entirety of the fifth chapter of the Revelation to John. And I say, you may just want to listen, because I, what I want you to do is I want you to see what John tried to communicate to us about the worship going on in heaven. This book, no matter how you end up interpreting it, I think I'm at least on safe ground and probably won't have too many hymnals thrown at me. If I say that the book had a meaning to the people to whom it was originally written. And they were under persecution. There was the most powerful empire in the world saying, you must bow the knee and say, Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. And they could not do that because they had already bowed the knee and said, Jesus is Lord. Jesus Kurios. And so they are persecuted. They're a small minority. And it looks like the whole weight of the world is against them. And yet, right at the beginning of the book, that persecuted church is given a vision that reminds us that what's going on on earth does not exhaust what's going on in God's creation. And that in the very throne room of God, he's still in control, he's still being worshiped. And the greatest emperor upon the planet is but a mere human being who, like the grass of the field, will someday fade and pass away. And so listen to the word of the Lord. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or even to look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, 
to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. Can anyone understand that picture without recognizing the Christian revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity? Remember, never allow those who oppose your position to define the parameters of the argument. Always make them fit their view of Jesus into whatever text they're asking you about. And so... Let's ask a Jehovah's Witness. How do you understand a text like this? Well, what you have is you have Jehovah upon the throne, and then Michael the archangel is the lamb standing as if slain. Well, but he actually didn't rise from the dead, so it's, it's only allegorical. And the... Seven spirits of God, the seven eyes, that, that's all allegorical too because the spirit's not personal. The spirit's just God's impersonal active force like electricity or rushing water. And this is only relative worship. Well, okay, yeah, the exact same words are used in the worship of Jehovah. Uh, and yes, the lambs worship with the exact same words. But, but, but it's not real worship the second time around, you see. That's like asking them to look at Matthew 28, baptizing the name of Jehovah, Michael the Archangel, and an impersonal active force. <laughs> Doesn't work very well, does it? And of course, if you ask the Mormons, they don't have any problem with God the Father, Elohim on the throne, and Jehovah the Son is the, is the, is the Lamb, and the Spirit, unfortunately, is, an, is another of the offspring of Elohim, but this is just one heavenly scene of an infinite number of heavenly scenes because there's an infinite number of gods. And so this, is, this happens over and over and over. There's nothing special about this, nothing uncommon. This is just one of the many, the, the, the billions and billions and billions of universes in the incredibly polytheistic Mormon comprehension of things. If you ask the Muslim, impossible. Couldn't happen. Allah is too exalted to be seen in these, these ways. Jesus is a mere Razul. This is just all, well, as Ahmed Didot liked to describe the book of Revelation, looks like someone had eaten too much pizza before they wrote this. It's just delusional. But clearly, those to whom these words were written were individuals who understood what you and I understand this day. I hope that encourages you. I hope you think about the fact that you stand in a long line of believers. I think one of the greatest tragedies of the millennial generation is that they seem to have absolutely no connection whatsoever to those who've gone before them. No sense of history. No sense of connectedness. Oh, I understand sometimes people can go way overboard in, in ancestor worship and all the rest of that stuff. But especially for Christians, we are not the first Christian generation. We have much to learn from those who came before. God has been building his church. And that gives me confidence for the future. No matter how difficult things are, he's going to keep building his church. Of course, that presupposes that Jesus is who we think he is. Everything that we believe has that presupposition. The gospel is Trinitarian. That's not my subject, but I could have preached on it. The gospel is Trinitarian. Why do we have any confidence, for example, in the perfection of the work of Jesus Christ? Why, when we read in John chapter 6, I have come down out of heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me... And what is the will of him who sent me? That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. If Jesus is not the divine second person of the Trinity, that promise is only as good as what any creature could promise us. 
Your very, the very certainty of your relationship to God the Father who will judge all things in Jesus Christ, it's all based upon whether Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be or he was not. And if he was not, let's just admit it, we are playing religious games here. Nothing more. I've mentioned to you yesterday the sobering words of Jesus in John 8, 24. But I repeat them in your hearing once again in demonstrating the absolute necessity of the doctrine of the Trinity and the fact that we are forced by the biblical revelation to identify this as the core. It cannot be something off to the side, even though it very often is the experience of many people today. Well, yeah, that's that tough doctrine over there. I'm glad that I've just got Jesus. I don't need to worry about that doctrine over there. No. Read Jesus. He doesn't allow you to come to that conclusion. Because he says to the Jews who are as close to him as you are to me, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sin. Have you ever thought about the amazing, the amazing claim that he was making? I mean, it's, it's understandable why the Jews are going, you have a demon. What, what do you mean? You're claiming to be the I am? And you can see it at the end of the chapter. You're, you're, you're not yet 50 years old, and Abraham has seen your day. And when Jesus very clearly says, before Abraham was, I am. They know exactly what he's saying. And they pick up stones to stone him because what are the few things you're supposed to stone someone for? One of them's blasphemy. And they understand that unless he is that, and they don't even leave that as a possibility, then he must be committing blasphemy. Did Jesus really believe that? Did he really believe, unless you believe that I am? I mean, so many people today, they, they look at Jesus, and he was just so loving. He was so kind and tenderhearted. I mean, we've all seen the, the painting of Jesus, and he's carrying the little lamb. He looks like a heavy metal rocker for some reason, but he's carrying this. <laughs> and he's white, too. I thought he was Jewish. I, I, I'm really confused at times, but... He's carrying this little lamb, or he's with the little children on the hillside and all, you know, and he wears pastel colors all the time. And, and, or the worst one where he's standing outside the knoblest door, helplessly knocking, can I come in, please? You know, and then, you know, I understand the sentiment and all that stuff. I get it. But the problem is those don't represent, especially the Jesus of the book of Revelation, you know, ruling the nations with a rod of iron and, you know, opening the seals and the wrath of God wiping out a third of humanity and all the rest of this kind of stuff. Uh, that, that kind of Jesus we're, we're not so, so comfortable with. But here, Jesus, well, isn't, isn't the Jesus of the Gospel of John the, the Jesus of just John 3.16? For God so loved the world. I mean, it's just the, it's that, it's that, it's that puppy love that just goes to everybody, right? No, not if you're consistent. Not if you listen to what Jesus is actually saying. And you know why this is extremely important, folks? Because the world is telling you and me every single day in regards to marriage and sexuality and family that love is what the world defines it to be, and it's primarily an emotional state. If you want to see what real love is, when Jesus says, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, that's a loving statement. When your doctor looks at you and says, you've got prostate cancer, we need to deal with it now. That's not hateful. And yet the world is saying to us, oh, we, we never want to offend anybody. Well, I'd be offended by that. I don't want to hear those words, but if I have it, I need to hear it. We need to be very quick to say to the world, your definition of love is self-destructive and foolish. But I don't hear too many people saying that. I don't hear too many people saying that. Jesus actually says that there is a substance to faith. There are certain things you have to believe. And it's a whole lot more than what most people are willing to give Jesus because there are lots of people that are willing to believe Jesus existed. There are those few weird people that are trying to deny that he existed. But most people will say Jesus existed and, and most people will say he was a good moral teacher 
Some might go so far to say he was even sent by God. And in that day, I mean, when you feed 5,000, it's pretty tough to, you know, resist the claim that here is a miracle worker, someone who has God's favor, raising the dead. Many would have accepted him as, as a prophet, even as the Messiah. That wasn't enough. That wasn't it. Wait a minute, I'm, 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 I'm believing a lot of things about Jesus. It's not enough. Saving faith has to have the proper saving object. And Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you will be left to face the consequences of your own sins. Saving faith has a content, and that saving faith has an object, and that object is a divine Savior not a mere human being. Oh, he was truly human, but not merely human. That same apostle, in writing one of his epistles, 1 John chapter 2, said these words. Beginning in verse 22, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. If you believe those words, you're going to be forced into some fairly unpopular positions. You know the big controversy right now. If you want to be considered loving and open-minded... Christians and Muslims worship the same God, right? You can't, you can't make any, any qualifications there. You can't say, well, we're talking about the God who revealed himself to Abraham. Yeah, yeah, we're saying that, but that's not enough because he didn't just stop with revealing himself to Abraham. The whole essence of the Christian faith is that that wasn't where he finished his revelation. And so to allow that to be sufficient to answer, well, yes, of course, is to miss the central fact of what Warfield just, read, just gave to us in a lengthy quotation, and that is that the fundamental revelation of his nature came in the incarnation and the outpouring of the Spirit. And so if you deny those things, as the Quran does, as Islam does, how can you say we're worshiping the same God? It is a fundamental contradiction, but the world does not want to give us the right to define our own faith in that way. And they consider it unloving, and unkind, and let's admit it, I certainly see on Facebook a lot of people address that subject in a rather unkind way. We don't help ourselves when we address this subject with a flamethrower rather than with words seasoned with grace. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. But the reality is this text says God has revealed himself, and if you reject the testimony that the Father has given to the Son, then you don't have either the Father or the Son. You reject the Son, you don't have the Father either. Well, you, you, mean, you mean Jewish worship isn't acceptable before God any longer? Seems to be what the New Testament says, huh? Whatever the strange fellow living in Rome says these days who recently came out with a, well, actually the entire magisterium came out with a statement recently that I, I, I guess this part sort of fell out of the Bible. I'm, I'm not really sure how it ended up working out, but, but they're, they're confused about what you do in regards to this. And even, even those folks who write toe tap and music that we really, really like, that sometimes ends up in our worship services, but they don't believe in Trinity. Oh, T.D. Jakes? No, he's included. How about Phillips, Craig, and Dean? Yeah, I know. How about those? There, there, and there's others, too. There's entire churches now where, where, where it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity. It's sort of like, well, some people th say this and some people say that, and we're really not sure, but you're, everyone's just come on along. You're all welcome. That's pagan worship. That's the, that's the unknown God. We're not really sure what God's like, but come on, we'll worship it, them, it, something, anyhow. Nah, that's, the only way that works is that you get people excited about themselves, make themselves feel better in the service, and that means it really doesn't have anything to do with God anyways because you can't define who God is. What a mess. What a mess. 
Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. In the United Pentecostal Church International, the official doctrine is that Jesus was two persons. He was two persons. He, his physical nature was the Son, so the Son is created. The Son is not eternal. The Son is not divine. And he's indwelt by another person who is the one person of God, Unitarianism. And so Jesus' prayer life is the greatest example of New Testament schizophrenia. It is. The greatest refutation, in my opinion, of oneness Pentecostalism is seen in examining the prayers of Jesus. Because in John chapter 17, where he says to the Father, what does he say to him? Glorify me, Father, with the glory which I had in your presence before the world was. That's one side of Jesus talking to the other side of Jesus. And sadly, there's a lot of Christians that go, that's not what we believe? No, it's not. That is one divine person, self-conscious of his divine being, self-conscious of his eternal existence, speaking to another divine person about the time in eternity past when the two were together in glory. Now, the one has voluntarily made himself of no reputation. He's entered into physical existence. He's laid aside the privileges that were his in service to others, which is the very definition of humility of mind, which is what Philippians 2, 5 to 11 is all about, and therefore is able to speak to the Father in that way. But you have two divine persons. If language means anything... You have two divine persons there. You don't have a, one person who's mumbling to himself. And that's why when people say, but, but wait a minute, you, you, you can't possibly tell me that you're saying that even the oneness Pentecostals, you would say that they're not in the kingdom of God, that they're not saved, and I have to go to 1 John chapter 2. But they, they affirm the deity of Christ. Isn't that all that we need? I'm very concerned that in our day, we have this mere Christianity movement. Now, I'm not talking about the book. I'm talking about the boiling the Christian faith down to this. Remember doing LCDs? Not, not, not the things on your watch, but a least common denominator stuff in, back in, I don't know, sixth grade, junior high school, whenever it was, you were doing fractions and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And you had to find the least common denominator. And today we have an entire movement where you try to find the least common denominator. And it's sort of the Trinity, deity of Christ, resurrection, uh, virgin birth, and that's pretty much it. The one thing they always leave out is the gospel, which means you end up disassociating and disconnecting the Trinity from the very matrix that makes it so personal and meaningful to us, and that is the, the gospel. The fact that we know this because God has revealed himself as redeemer. That's one of the things Warfield was saying. We primarily see this in the fact that God has, has acted with such power and such intimacy in providing for salvation in and of himself through his son. And this movement ends up with a, a form of Christianity that is barren, shallow, and even they would say, well, these people believe in the deity of Christ. But they do not believe that the Son is divine. They do not believe the Son has eternally existed. And whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. That was John's warning. When people talk about Trinitarian texts, obviously they eventually get to the end of Matthew's gospel, which is why so many who have denied the Trinity have over the years sought to question the validity of this text. Uh, the reality is that there is absolutely no consistent basis upon which any person who studies ancient manuscripts and the transmission of the text in ancient manuscripts would ever question the originality of the ending of the Gospel of Matthew. There just isn't any manuscript evidence to support it. It's all theoretical. There are people who do that. There are various groups. I've seen many oneness folks question the reality of this text. Why? Because of how clear it is. Because of how clear it is. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Can you see why non-Trinitarians want to try to banish this text? Try to put a non-divine Jesus into this text. Try to put a, a Moses I mean, if anyone had closer communion with God himself than Moses, who might it have been? He saw God face to face. He's on the mountain. He comes down. He's glowing for crying out loud. He has been so immersed in the divine presence that his face glows. But can you imagine Moses ever saying what Jesus said there? It's impossible. No mere creature could ever say these words. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. You see why many secular governments are frightened by real Christianity? Oh, that, the Jesus in the, in, the, in the manger scene, that's okay. He's cool because he's not threatening. But when people get hold of this Jesus actually ruling and reigning over everything and that all authority is his authority and in fact if you have authority you're going to be judged by him as to what you did with it something we might want to mention to Supreme Court justices but you're going to be judged for that by him that's uncomfortable that's uncomfortable oh but, but it was given to him he's speaking as the resurrected one he has gone through humiliation, and now he has received, is receiving, he's about to ascend into the very presence of the Father, his exaltation, just as we see in the Carmen Christi in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And so now we have one who can judge and judge with all righteousness because he was made like unto us. No one's going to be able to say, well, you don't know what it's like to be us. Well, actually, the Son does. And hence, his judgment is one that is in accordance with truth. And he has all authority. And therefore, we are to go and make disciples of all nations. And since our Lord reigns over all those nations, then we have the right in those nations to proclaim that gospel. And many a Christian has died, has given his life as testimony to the lordship of Jesus Christ when those nations sought to restrict the very message of the one who rules over them. We are to baptize them in the name, singular, not the names, but the name, singular, of Father, not Father, Son, Spirit. It's a very balanced, very balanced in the original language, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So in other words, there is a transference of authority. When we speak what Christ has commanded us to speak, we have his authority in so doing. There is a dearth of authoritative preaching and teaching in the church today. You know where it comes from? Because we don't really believe that we possess the very word of God. And I know others have already told it to you this, this, this weekend. But when you do the work of exegesis, when you engage your mind and your heart, you do the work of honestly handling the word of God, you are taking yourself out of the center and you are allowing the one who wrote the words to actually speak rather than putting yourself in the position of the one speaking. You see, when we do sound exegesis, we're honoring God by allowing God to speak. When we do lousy exegesis, we're dishonoring God and dishonoring his people by putting in the pulpit a mere man rather than the one who is bringing the message of God. So don't let anyone ever convince you that it's unspiritual to do hard work of interpretation and exegesis. That's not unspiritual. That is an act of worship and service to the people of God. 
And then Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Moses could never say that. Moses had to look toward the end of his life. He had to, he had to pick a, a successor, who then had to pick a successor. None of the great prophets could ever say, I will be with you to the end of the age. Jesus can say the very words of God because what does Emmanuel mean but God with us? Here Jesus fulfills that prophetic terminology of himself from Isaiah 7 and a number of passages between Isaiah 7 and 11 where Emmanuel is used. God with us, this is Jesus' promise to us. And so the topic that we have had over the course of this study is not merely one aspect of systematic theology that we can put over here and then we can get together at another time and we'll have soteriology over here and then we can have ecclesiology over here and uh, it's sort of radioactive so we'll put eschatology over here because it gets everybody upset. Far too many people approach the Christian faith and put these things into these, these little holes and never bring them close enough to see if they're actually consistent with one another. You don't create a beautiful woven fabric of truth by having one doctrine over here and one doctrine over there. You bring them together, and it's in their consistency that the beauty of the faith is seen. But the reality is, in our day, the vast majority of theologizing, teaching, and preaching is done with the Trinity way over there someplace. Out of fear that you're going to lose the audience, I would call that actually distrust of the Spirit of God. I mean, if I'm standing up here, if it's up to me to keep you all with me, I mean, I'm going to do everything I can to be as clear as I can, but I recognize that fundamentally, unless the Spirit of God meets with us, we are wasting our time. Waste of the electricity and a waste of the heat. Unless the Spirit of God, but you can trust the Spirit of God to lead the people of God. And so, so often, the preaching and the teaching, if we're honest, someone could attend most churches and say, well, yeah, I, I think they're Trinitarian. I saw it in the hymnal. But I never heard him say anything about it. Should that be true of us? Should that be true of our churches? And I say, well, it, it, it's not like every sermon has to, be, has to be on the Trinity. No, but every sermon is preached in light of the truth of the Trinity and cannot be anything other than that. It cannot be placed over the side. And, of course, you know why I'm focused upon this. Because I have spent so much of my life now defending various elements of this truth against those who would deny it. Not only those who are false teachers within what calls itself Christianity, but now in dealing with other religions as well that bring their attacks against the doctrine of the Trinity. So it's easy for me to see how important it is, but I'm just simply saying, hey, I can't be out there telling the Muslims that the Trinity is at the very core of our message, the very core of our being. It's at the very, it defines our worship when the reality in the church is something completely different. Where you could attend a church for months on end and listen to the hymns and not really know if they're Trinitarian, uh, Sabellian, modalistic, what form of modalism they have, if they're a subordinationist. Those things should be pretty clear. They should be right out front in how the, in how the prayers take place. In, in, in the confession of the church, it should be as clear as can be. And we simply must stand against every kind of pressure that is brought against us to compromise on this issue. You might say, oh, come on. There's, is there really any danger that we're going to give in like uh, 
Pope Liberius did and signed the Arianized Sirmium Creed after the Council of Nicaea under pressure from the government and stuff like that. You don't really think that's going to happen. No, but let me suggest something to you. Think about this. We believe that Jesus is the incarnate second person of the Trinity, therefore he's the creator of all things. As the creator of all things, he gets to define how all things should be. Therefore, when he, in Matthew chapter 19, interprets his own scripture from Genesis 1 and 2 and says, from the beginning it was not so. From the beginning, God made them male and female and said... A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cling to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. If we are willing to say, you know what? Jesus may have taught that. But our society now says that we can't really say what Jesus said. And that's not a hill to die on. Therefore, we're going to go along. I say to you, how can you be a Trinitarian? How can you allow the very teaching of the incarnate Son of God on the exact issue where the culture says, bow to Caesar, and you go ahead and, yes, sir, yes, sir, I bow to Caesar. How do you actually believe in the deity of Christ? How are you actually allowing a consistency to exist between what you believe about who God is and what you believe about what God has taught you in his word? Think about that. Think about that. Warfield told us that the allusions to the Trinity are easy, confident. They just sort of go by us. Remember in, in Ephesians, you know, there's, there's, there's one God, one Lord, one Spirit. You know, it's not like Paul is going, oh, yeah, I, I really haven't gotten around to trying to get these people to believe in this Trinity thing yet, so let's, let's come up with, a, with a, a, a teaching section on this. No. It's, it's something that the Christians shared in common. And when we look at it, we can go, oh, yeah, you know, it's a common term for the Father is God. Tom Kurt, common Trinitarian name for the, the Son is Kurios, Lord. You have the Spirit. Here you've got a, one of these many triune passages, and it just sort of, Rolls off the tongue because it's natural for Paul to speak that way. That's what his background is. That's, that's just how things are. There's a lot of them like that. But one of them I will finish with this morning. It's often used as a benediction. But think about what it means. Paul ended his second letter to the Corinthians. And those letters, both those letters were tough to write tough material and yet Paul's benediction to the Corinthians the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ grace how many times do you have the grace of God but here it's the grace of Jesus is that a different kind of grace no the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God how many times is it the love of Christ? Again, the ease with which the terminology is used. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Koinonia, don't we love that? We may not know many other Greek words, but koinonia, that, that sounds great. We're going to have to have a youth group named koinonia, right? But it's a beautiful word. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit, which is that fellowship which allows, which allows me to travel all over the world and minister in places where I don't understand a word they're saying. But I fully understand what they're believing. Why? Because we have one spirit. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Trinitarian thinking. Natural. Easy. Because the apostle understands what God has done in that revelation of the Son and the Spirit, the incarnation of the Son, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is the faith of the church. And so hear those words as Paul said them. E charis tu kuriu Jesu Christu. Kai he agape tu theiu. Kai he koinonia. To Hagio Numatas.
metapanton humon. Amen.